Thank you very much indeed, Marion. Um, it's so great to join you all in Bournemouth. I've already been down to the beach, uh, got here a little bit early, and it's lovely to see, enjoy the sunshine. It's looking and feeling actually very different uh, to when I was here last for the Green Party Spring Conference last year, when almost all transport was brought to a grinding halt uh, with a massive snowfall. Uh, the irony of uh, erratic weather resulting from climate change threatening our conference wasn't lost on us. Um, needless to say, I was checking the train times rather nervously when I left London at 6.30 this morning. But I join you as a representative of a party in a very different position, as marion has been saying, in local government compared to last year. Uh, the May election saw the number of councillors more than double. Um, and I was just at the most recent, rather belated spring conference, this time another seaside town of Scarborough. And there someone stopped me in the hall and so came up to me very excitedly. He said, I heard you speak at a festival last year and I've joined the party. And I was absolutely thrilled. He said, uh, and then I stood as a paper candidate, he said. Oh, that's really encouraging. I said, that's really great. He said, and I got elected. <laughs> uh, trying to work out whether he was angry or pleased. Um, but 90% of the seats that we won in May's elections were in seats where we'd been working really hard for the local community. And it's been quite a ride. But I want to pay tribute to all those uh, councillors that were elected in each and every one of those wins. And it is true that there's a green wave sweeping right across Europe uh, right now with a growing awareness of the urgent work that we have to do in the face of climate breakdown. In England and Wales, with the giant first-past-the-post electoral hurdle, it was a huge achievement breaking through onto more than 50 new councils. And we're working to make the Green Party a party that really represents the length and breadth of the country. We're getting there from the depths of rural Hertfordshire uh, to the heart of urban Sunderland. And that was, of course, followed by an equally exciting European uh, election campaign, three MEPs becoming seven, the first elected in Yorkshire and Humber, Eastern and Northwest regions. And it's a testament to the seismic change, I think, that's happening in British politics right now that just 10 years, just 10 years after Yorkshire and the Humber sent a member of the British National Party to the European Parliament, they elected a black refugee standing for the Green Party, something of which we're immensely proud. I know it will not be a conviction shared by everyone in this hall, but I very much hope that next year we will be standing at the LGA conference still talking about the great ongoing work of our MEPs enhancing environmental protection and workers' rights, supporting the European projects in many parts of the UK that tragically fit the poverty criteria for funding from Brussels. It's our conviction that we do need a people's vote to sort out the mess that we're in, but we must also heal our country and tackle the pressing issues weighing so heavily on our communities today. And what distinguishes, I think, as a party is that we're not just tough on Brexit, but we're tough on the causes of Brexit. I lead the uh, Green Group, as Marion said, the official opposition on Lambeth Council in South London, where a few years ago we got our first councillor elected in Streatham. We did so after standing up for local residents whose sheltered housing was about to be bulldozed by a council that wasn't listening to local people. We gave them back their homes and we gave them back control. And in 2016, for the first time in many people's lives, in contrast to the safe seats in so many parts of the country where MPs have jobs for life, they knew that their votes would really count. There was a howl of rage to take back control. People said they wanted to take back control of their communities and of their lives, and I think they were absolutely right to say it. Not long before um, that event, I'd been canvassing in my local community, and a woman in her 80s came to the door. Politicians, she threw up her hands when we opened, when she opened the door to us. She said, I don't vote. We asked why. And the answer wasn't really what we were expecting. Politicians killed my family, she said. We were left absolutely speechless. And after a period of silence, we asked the obvious question, you know, what, what happened? She explained that she's from a former Soviet state and politicians had indeed killed her family and her friends. And there was nothing that we were going to say, we were going to do that were going to make things better. So we just asked, look, is, is there anything we can do to help you? She took us to the back of her house and she showed us a beautiful rose garden that was her pride and joy. She explained how she absolutely loved nature. And then she said, look, I've always wanted just a few trees outside my house in the street. I know it's a cliche with the Green Party. 
I wa she wanted a few trees, and she said, I've asked the council, and nothing's ever happened. So we went away and sorted it out. Six months later, she got those trees. And come election day, Katrina wasn't just voting for the Green Party. She hadn't just joined the Green Party. She went out in her 80s at Streatham Hill Station giving out leaflets. I hear from so many people, as I'm sure you do, that they have given up on politics for whatever reason. They actually know that politics matters. They care about their communities, but they've lost faith in the system. They want to believe desperately that change is possible, that the system will deliver for them. And that's one of the things that gives me hope for the future, that we can, at the local level, deliver such meaningful change for local people in a small way or in a big way, that we can show that their votes and their trust in us really does count for something. Last night, I was in Westminster in the House of Commons at the launch uh, of the Good Systems Agreement. It's a cross-party, non-party agreement between a wide range of political actors, brokered by the youth-driven Make Votes Matter campaign. And they want to agree on a way forward for the future um, to sort out an antique, disastrous, and failing Westminster system. It's a system that hasn't changed significantly in 100 years, one that's produced our conflict-driven, divisive politics that's now, it's generally agreed, entirely broken. It's a system that's left us an international laughingstock, the world looking on at us, upon us in pity. The need to make Britain a democracy, a true democracy, with a fair voting system as a and a written constitution, I think, is obvious. And Make Votes Matters rightly focused on the crucial aspect of making votes match seats in the House of Commons for every voter to know that their vote is valued and their vote will make a difference. This is the seat of government, the place of crucial national decisions being made, and it's right that we focus on the changes that we have to make there. But as a political party, the Greens also believe we need to look more broadly. Just fixing the House of Commons and electing the Lords won't fix our broken politics. For that, we need to look to a political philosophy that is, for us as Greens, absolutely central, that political decisions should be made as locally as possible by the people affected by them and only referred upwards when absolutely necessary. It used to be called localism until Eric Pickles degraded the word almost to the point of destruction. But let's give it a, give it a different name. Let's call it democracy. Let's call it real democracy that allows people to take control of their lives, of their communities, to collectively decide ways in which they can meet everyone's needs whilst living within the limits of this one fragile planet. Over the last six months, I spent quite a bit of time working with young people, the school strikers, who have taken time out of school to go and march for what they see and what they know to be a climate emergency. And working alongside those young people, marching alongside them, invariably they've turned around to me and said in a repeated refrain, what's the point in pursuing an education if I have no future ahead of me? These are the leaders of tomorrow, but they are the leaders of today. And they are showing leadership where our political system and our political leaders have failed. And one of the calls of Extinction Rebellion, the wave of civil disobedience demanding action on the climate emergency, has been the formation of citizens' assemblies. It's been no surprise to us in the Green Party who know that we need a radical shift of power if we are to address the great challenges of our age, whether that be rampant inequality, social division, or the climate crisis. We, of course, need a fair voting system at the local level, one where votes match seats, a luxury that the Scots already enjoy with their proportional electoral system. But we need to go much further. We need to look at some of the most successful communities, societies, nations in the world, like the Scandinavians, who are delivering more equal, more stable, more secure communities. And those are communities where decisions are made locally, where local government is powerful, and people know decisions affecting them are made close to them. It's a central part of the green understanding of democracy. I hardly need in front of this audience to describe how this isn't currently the case in the UK. We are generally accurately described as the most centralized state in Europe. Westminster decides local government does its bidding or is overridden when it tries to resist. That's the case for Lancashire County Council, which said no to fracking and was overruled. 
It's the case in local communities where services are stretched to bursting point and beyond, where GPs are overloaded, where schools are underfunded, where there are no local shops for residents to walk or cycle to, or are being told they have to accept hundreds or thousands of new homes. That's the only way their local plan will be accepted. And until they meet the Westminster strictures, developers will have open season to demand developments where they like. It's the case where local communities want to control local services, but have been pushed by Westminster, by governments of a range of political hues, into outsourcing. That's what's produced the disastrous destruction of street trees in Sheffield. It isn't only that control is tightly held in often far-off Westminster, with decisions made with little understanding of local conditions, needs and wishes. That's also where most of the money is too. Funding to local government has been slashed, as we know, to the point where councillors find themselves with barely enough funds to meet their statutory responsibilities. The responsibility is dictated by Westminster and not decided by local people. Let's say it again, the people who wanted to take back control in 2016 were absolutely right to say so. They aren't in control, and they know it. And instead of the reform that we so desperately need, politicians at Westminster have blamed and scapegoated, pursuing a politics of divide and rule, whether that be migrants or whether that be the disabled, blaming the young or blaming the old, when the problem is the system itself. Our problem isn't Brussels. That's a potential source of power, support, a source of resources for local communities with enough resources and power to make direct contact, particularly the communities in Britain neglected by Westminster for decades. They are the potential recipients of huge amounts of EU funding for some of the most disadvantaged communities in the UK, a classification that fits far too many of our communities. Being tough on the causes of Brexit means demanding the restoration of power to local communities, to let them take back control, to be able to approach Brussels for money and to decide themselves how it's spent, to be able to tell Westminster that they need real decision-making power and resources to fund local buses, local social care, local children's services, to be able to follow the Preston model of supporting local businesses in their commissioning and planning. We've heard talk of devolution in England, of course. We've even had delivery of something that looks a bit like it in Manchester and Liverpool, the West Midlands, and the Sheffield City region, for example. But that's been limited, constrained, a constrained form of devolution. Westminster still controls the purse strings, sets the rules, negotiates with a handful of local power figures, figures put in control by that disastrous first-past-the-post model that's caused such chaos. Then what is decided is imposed on the people. That isn't genuine democratic devolution. It isn't democracy. Let's say it clearly. Local government is not democratic because it isn't allowed to be so by Westminster. We need to let local communities and regions decide how to govern themselves and then ensure that they have the financial resources to do what needs doing. Despite the inadequacies, however, the genie, I believe, has been let out of the bottle. The appetite for change is clear, and change is coming. We may disagree on much, but it's hard to deny that the status quo, the way things are in the UK, constitutionally, economically, socially, environmentally, educationally, are profoundly unstable. And there is a strong and there is a growing appetite to be more transformative, to transform every area of our life. There's nowhere that this is clearer than in the issue on which the Greens are clearly leading, our climate emergency. We've got well over 100 councils now in the country who've declared that emergency. We've got a national government that's done the same, although given its plans for Heathrow expansion, for new road building, its failure to support renewable energy and energy conservation, you'd hardly know it. I'm proud that in Bristol it was Carla, Carla Denya who led the way in the first such declaration. And it's Greens up and down the country who've been prominent in many more of those de declarations, working, of course, on a cross-party basis. This is crucial, of course, in its own terms. The IPCC tells us we only have 11 years, 11 years to turn it around, to turn around our existential crisis and the future of the planet, to prevent the catastrophe of runaway climate chaos. 
and the seeds and the scale of the change required across agriculture, across transport, industry, housing, every sector of society is just beginning to sink in. Everything, everything needs to change. There is a growing realization that the social, economic, political, and environmental crisis we face are interlinked. When I was growing up uh, in the 1970s, I was born in 1971. I know I don't look old enough, do I? Someone say it. We were told that we were going to face a future where we would have unprecedented amounts of wealth created, where we would have that uh, endless supply of energy discovered, when we'd have that technological revolution that, that meant we could all work shorter hours doing more things that we loved. Well, fast forward 40 years. The economy is three times the size that it was. We have increased our wealth three times as much. The population hasn't grown three times as much, but our wealth has. We have discovered that endless supply of renewable energy, the sun, the wave, the wind. Six tidal lagoons down the west coast of Wales could generate as much power when we want it uh, as Hinkley. We have got that technological revolution with the microchip, but have we seen the benefits shared out equally? No. Instead, we've seen us working longer hours. We've seen growing and rampant inequality and the cost the huge colossal cost, that existential crisis, that climate emergency that we now face. The problem is not that there isn't enough wealth or the expertise or the technology. The problem is that the wealth is in the wrong hands and there is no political will to tackle what needs to be done. What we're seeing now is a system that is trashing the planet and it's that same system that is creating that society in which millions are struggling and over one million food bank emergency parcels are issued every year. Struggling with the impacts of austerity forced on us by Westminster that's meant crucial services from children's centres to libraries to public health support have been lost. Struggling with the dominance of multinational companies benefiting from the support of Westminster, squashing the small independent businesses that are at the heart of our local communities. Struggling with the filthy air and the degraded natural environment driven by those Westminster policies. We can, in taking the actions necessary to cut our carbon emissions to net zero by 2030, also make huge strides in improving the lives of everyone in our communities, but particularly the lives of the poorest. If we ensure everyone lives in a warm, comfortable, affordable to heat home, then we'll improve lives and cut pressure on the NHS. If we support active transport and public transport, we will clear the air that we all breathe, cut the congestion on our streets and improve the well-being of our residents. It seems usual in British politics just now to look backwards for precedents and models for the way forward. Last night I was pointing out with the Make Votes Matter campaign that there's parallels between the solutions and the, uh, today and the Great Reform Act of 1867. In asserting the rights of parliaments against the executive, Speaker John Burko was recently dusting off some vellum from 1604. But I'm going to outreach even John Burko and go back to the 14th century to a proverb. From little acorns, mighty oaks grow. Communities, councils up and down the land are seizing the day and declaring their determination to act on the climate emergency. From the parish council in Haddenham, Buckinghamshire, the seaside town of Scarborough and the Welsh county of Paris, they are saying they are determined to tackle our climate emergency. They are taking control, building democracy from the roots upwards against the force of Westminster. I want to end with a story. In the early 1990s, I was working in the House of Commons and one of my heroes back then was Tony Benn a veteran politician, a Marmite politician, you either loved him or hated him. But wherever you stood on Tony Benn, you respected his 50 years working uh, in Westminster. And when he retired, he said, I'm leaving the House of Commons to concentrate on politics. I'm leaving the House of Commons to concentrate on politics. And he knew that actually politicians operate in a very, very confined space. And it's often it's the movements that change whole agendas. It's the work from the ground up, from local councils, from unions, from community groups, from residence groups that manage to shift whole agendas. And right now, I profoundly believe we are seeing a whole new agenda emerging. 
uh, with the Attenborough documentary, with the school strikers, uh, with Extinction Rebellion, uh, with the rise of smaller parties. The ground is shifting. The tectonic plates of politics are shifting. And I believe that together we can change that agenda. United, we can work together to ensure there is a future and ensure that future is genuinely democratic. Thank you. Thank you, you very much. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much Please. indeed. Um, that's brilliant. Uh, thank you. And uh, there are a few phrases there that I'm going to keep hold of. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'd like to now invite you to t ask what questions you would like to ask. Um, it's your opportunity. And uh, I can see one number over there. Number two. Number two, if you could give the... Oh, sorry, uh, uh, yeah. Is there anybody? Yeah, here's number one. Yes, sorry, thank you. Behind you, number one, sorry. Um, I love what you say about localism, but is there a need for a national economic housing strategy? Because at the moment, all the housing is being concentrated in the southeast. We're facing a real shortage of water in the southeast. How, how do you balance a national plan with supporting localism? If you just say your name and where you're from Sorry. as well. Victoria, Victoria Harvey, Central Bedfordshire Council. Thank you. Do you want to take two at a time? Are there any others? Somewhere here? Yes, thank you. In the middle. I'll come back to you. I see you. Hello. Uh, Gronway Edwards, uh, Deputy Leader of Conway Council in North Wales. Um, totally agree with the uh, Tidal Lagoon uh, opportunity in Wales. We've just, uh, well, they realised that Wilbur Bay, which is a nuclear power station, would probably not happen in Anglesey. Uh, I'm a farmer. Uh, I've been uh, a green farmer all my life. I believe there's a real opportunity for re renewable energy. Those tidal barrages are the way forward. Not only would it give protection, uh, power for millions of people in, in the, the north. It would also give tidal uh, flood protection for the whole of the coast of North Wales. So we must put pressure on government to look at these alternatives. We have one of the largest wind farms offshore in North Wales. Green energy is the way forward, but we must put pressure on government to rise to this opportunity, a real opportunity to turn this country around into a clean powerhouse. Thank you, and wave power. <laughs> uh, Gillian, at the front here. Thank you very much. Councillor Gillian Ford, London Borough of Havering. I've submitted to Council a motion on Wednesday on a climate change emergency, and an amendment has come forward yesterday from another group, and I would welcome your response to their comments, and I quote, Council agrees calls to declare a climate emergency are misplaced because man-made climate change is an elementary scam requiring only a basic understanding of carbon dioxide to understand. Your comments, please. <laughs> Thank you. It's bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, on the climate emergencies, I, I think it's really important that we have an implementation plan. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, Let's chat afterwards, um, because I, I'd, I'd love to make something out of that. Um, but we do, we've, we've got another motion coming through. We passed a climate emergency in, in Lambeth. We've got another motion coming up on our, our full council uh, to get the proper implementation plan. I think holding the council's feet to the fire is a very important next stage after passing those climate emergencies. On the um, tidal lagoons, I mean, New Economics Foundation reckons that we can generate over six times our annual electricity needs uh, very, very quickly right now just uh, through offshore wind, wave, tidal lagoons. Um, but I think we need to think bigger than just uh, uh, energy as the issue around tackling the climate emergency. I think we're winning the argument on that. Um, it's you know, onshore wind is now the cheapest form of electricity generated. Um, we've got to look very, very seriously at how we decarbonize the heat supply. You think of everyone's got a gas boiler, or most people have got a gas boiler in the house. You know, we need to be having uh, change now, but also decarbonizing right across the economy is the big thing. You know, 
in agriculture, in uh, industry, in transport. I think that's the next big thing. And the, you know, government, while it expands Heathrow, uh, while it spends 56 billion on HS2, which is going to destroy 100 ancient woodlands, rather than investing that money, you know, 500 million in 114 towns and cities, revolutionising local transport to give people the options to get out of their cars. You know, we aren't going to make the progress that, that we need. So I think that's the next big challenge. On the housing strategy, uh, yeah, absolutely. When you think about, uh, I did some data crunching, you compare the 2001 census with the 2011 census, uh, you realize that actually we have, our housing has outstripped population hugely. Uh, and there isn't just an issue of supply and demand, there's an issue of allocation which we've got mm -hmm. to deal with. It's a broken system, uh, just like, you know, like the speculative markets, the commodity markets. Um, housing has become a speculative commodity, it's a broken market. Uh, there are now more rooms, and I'll repeat this, there are more rooms per head of population in this country than we have ever had at any point in our history. I'll say it again. There are more rooms per head of population in this country than we have ever had in our history. So we've got to look much more in depth in the housing issue, at the housing issue. Um, yes, that means a regional strategy, uh, looking at where uh, there are blocks in the system, uh, and it is gonna require a national strategy, but also, uh, I think, concerted political will on the local level. Um, to take money, if it is given by central government, from taking the subsidies away from buy-to-let landlords who have been overheating the market, putting it back into building uh, truly uh, democratically owned uh, housing, uh, community land trusts, uh, new social housing, uh, council housing. I welcome the lifting of the cap uh, on uh, borrowing in the housing revenue account, but uh, as we're finding in Lambeth, it's about also the ability to repay those loans, uh, which is the sticking point over years. So it does need that, that radical devolution of uh, funding down to the local level. Thank you very, very much indeed. And I would like to add that there are a number of different kinds of uh, a technology coming forward for all sorts of energy production, green energy production, and I think there's a whole new world that's developing fast there. So I look forward to that too. Um, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to Councillor Jonathan Bartley for a really good address and terrific answering of questions, which I think will help us a lot, even the one-word answers <laughs> for Julian in a council meeting. Um, but please, if everybody would kindly remain in your seats for the next plenary session, which is thriving economies, thriving communities, addressing our skills challenges. So a big thank you, Jonathan. Thank you.